Good evening, everyone. I am so happy to see you all here. I'm excited um, to welcome you to the Kimball's Friday Evening Lecture Series. And for this spring and summer, the lectures will focus on our current exhibition from the Lands of Asia, the Sam and Myrna Myers Collection, which is on view here in the pavilion. I hope you've had a chance to go through the exhibition. And if you haven't, that this lecture will inspire you to do so. Uh, just to mention uh, the upcoming lectures, uh, also to inspire you, on May 11th, we'll have Lee Talbot from the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C., who will speak on silk in Imperial China and beyond. On June 15th, we have Philip Hu from the St. Louis Museum of Art, who will um, lecture on Chinese porcelain, blue and white porcelain. And on July 13th, we'll have Keith Wilson from the Freer Sackler at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., who will discuss Chinese jades. But to kick off our series, it is my great pleasure to welcome and inter introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Catherine Ann Paul, Curator of the Arts of Asia at the Newark Museum in Newark, New Jersey. And I just want to give a plug for Newark and the Newark Museum. If you have not been, go. It's amazing. It is an amazing collection. Um, of both European and Asian and African. Uh, they have a really large Tibetan collection. Um, it's beautifully installed. It's in a wonderful building. And it's, n it's just across the river from Manhattan. It's very easy to get to. So uh, please um, go visit the Newark Museum. So since her appointment in 2008, uh, Katie has created eight temporary exhibitions and reinstalled 20 permanent galleries showcasing both traditional and contemporary art originating in different regions of Asia. She's currently working on several future special exhibitions. Uh, the first is Kimono Refashioned, 1870s to Now. Uh, this is in conjunction with the Kyoto Costume Institute, the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, and the Cincinnati Art Museum. And that'll be running from this fall through the spring of 2019. Um, also in 2019, she's working on Beyond Zen, Later Buddhist Art of Japan, and A Place of Dreams, which is a commissioned facade sculpture by the Korean artist Ik Jun Kang. In 2017, her exhibition, Secrets of Buddhist Art, Tibet, Japan, and Korea, was featured at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts in Nashville, Tennessee. Previously, Dr. Paul held posts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and the Textile Museum in Washington, DC. She lectures and publishes wi widely and holds a BA from Reed College and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A Fulbright Scholar, she has perf performed field research in 25 nations during the past 22 years. So she gets around. Uh, in Dr. Paul's lecture tonight, um, which is entitled Transcendent Specifics, Buddhist Arts of Tibet, Japan, Korea, and China. Um, in her talk, like the art of other global uh, religions, each region where Buddhism took hold developed locally specific iterations. While the central story about the life of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni is shared by all practitioners, in the artistic practices of Tibet, Japan, Korea, and China, images of figures other than other than the historical Buddha, rose in popularity. Each area made images from locally available materials and developed stylistic characteristics that are distinct to both place and time. In her lecture, Dr. Paul will not only unlock the basics of how to read narratives and iconography of Buddhist art, but will also highlight distinguishing factors of each regional manifestation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Paul. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a great pleasure to be here. I appreciate so much being invited. I know that you know how lucky you are to have Jennifer Price as your um, curator here. I adore her. We've known each other for a while, and it's um, um, she's one of the few curators who is responsible for as wide a purview as she is um, covering all of the non-Western world, and I uh, really admire her for her work there. So. Um, 
setting a timer so I won't go over. Uh, welcome to uh, Transcendent Specifics. Um, and what you're seeing in the screen bef in front of you are um, three works from the Myers Collection currently on view, as well as one work here from the Kimball Collection that is not yet on view, but I know will come back in future. Um, and they are, from the far side to the near side, a piece from China, Korea, Japan, and Tibet or Nepal. And by the end of this talk, you will be able to look at them and know what country they're coming from, I promise. But we're gonna start in an unusual place. We're gonna start with this guy. <laughs> so I think most of you know who he is, um, but every single image in the world relates to a particular time and place. This, of course, is Santa Claus. And you can tell what time he was made because of the style in which he was portrayed. You can even tell the function that he is doing, which is he's advertising Coca-Cola. This is also Santa Claus. Where do you think he is? Hawaii, exactly. We also know that this image of surfing with an aloha shirt or a Hawaiian shirt is a post-1950s image when both the shirt and the surfing world became really popular. And where do you think he is? Texas, Longhorn Cattle Drive on a Conestoga wagon. And the function of this is a theme park. So here we have different regions. You, you can also tell that there are different characteristics for each Santa. So the first Santa isn't wearing his normal cap, while the second Santa is wearing his normal cap, but not the normal clothing, and doesn't have the normal um, vehicle to be Santa. But neither does the lower one. Instead of having reindeer in a sleigh, he's got a Texan version of a reindeer in a sleigh and a Texan 10-gallon hat instead of Santa's hat. Nonetheless, you can still tell who he is, and that is iconography. Iconography is enough clues to tell you who the fella is. And here's the um, one that is a Russian-style Santa Claus. So there, gone is the usual red moniker. And this one is my favorite one of all. So this is a float in a parade. And I doubt anybody in this room could guess where it is. Because sometimes, despite our best efforts, we don't know where something's from. This is in Tokyo. So believe it or not, um, there are parades like this in Tokyo. So um, one more quick detour before we get to Asia, and I want to talk about place, other specifics of place. So maybe you know who this is, the Virgin of Guadalupe. So a Christian saint, but is she worshipped everywhere in the world? Not so much. She's really popular in Mexico because that is where she manifested as a saint. And so that gives you also a specific locality for a specific iconography. And any guesses who this guy might be? St. Patrick, you are quick. You saw that clover right off the, off the, off the bang. So, of course, St. Patrick became famous first in Ireland and then in the Irish diaspora. So that's another way in which images move. They start in one place but then move with the people who worship that particular saint. Now, this one already gives you the answer sheet because I don't know how many people know about St. Thomas, who is one of the apostles of Christ who was believed to travel to India where his descendants still live and worship Christ. Christ. And in fact, this is an Indian postage stamp um, celebrating St. Thomas. Um, here in the Kimball Collection, currently on view, I had the pleasure of seeing it, we have another saint, but again, one that had been more popular at one time than another time. So saints, like fashions, rise and fall in popularity. And this is St. James. Um, and you can tell which ones he's a saint because he's got a golden halo. So golden halos are a, a clue for what you're seeing. Um, and this has a great story about St. James, you know, instructing um, a disciple of a magician whose uh, demons were sent to attack James. And James says, no, 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 we're going to take care of it all. But again, a story that you might not know. This is also um, in the collection here at the Kimball. Um, and this is a Franciscan friar. And we don't know his name anymore. Certainly when he was portrayed, he was um, most likely a portrait of a specific person. But we can tell that he's Franciscan from the clothing that he wears, fashion tell all. So we're going to circle back to some of the concepts started with here. And um, I thought I'd also start by saying, we, in the U.S., think about Christianity often starting with a Roman Catholic church. But the reality is, is that from the earliest period of time, the Christian church went into two main streams, the Eastern Orthodox and the Western. And you can see at the bottom, on the far side, is an image here at the Kimball of a lovely Madonna and child, Italian. And on the near side is an image of Madonna and child, 
in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Byzantine. And then finally, getting back to the special exhibition again, um, we also have some spectacular images of Christian saints in the Asian world. Um, and these two are, are wonderful examples. The one on the far side in ivory, a material that of course is not from Europe, um, is, was made in Goa in India of uh, St. Anthony of Lisbon, who was born in Lisbon but who died in, in um, Padua. So sometimes he's called St. Anthony of Padua, even though he was born in Portugal. But the whole reason why he winds up in India is when the Portuguese went to India, they brought Christianity with them. Um, and here's St. Anthony um, in wood made in Portugal. So the material helps tell you where they are. Um, and then this lovely suite of objects, particularly this group of the Good Shepherd, are very typical of forms of the Good Shepherd you find made in Goa. Made in Goa, particularly for the Portuguese market. And they have this wonderful kind of woolen coat that the, that the shepherd wears um, with these great sheep crawling all over him. I love those two mountains. I urge you to go back and look at the mountain pieces that are on view. There's a great little lion face underneath um, the, the shepherd with the water spewing forth from a lion's face. Um, so really just fabulous pieces. Also, this posture is pretty unusual in Western depictions of those two images. One is Mary Magdalene looking a little come hither like, um, and the other is the, is the Good Shepherd sleeping. So even the posture um, helps you know where something is from. Um, also, to contrast material, this is in the Kimball collection. It's a silver uh, Madonna and Child, just to show how you can tell there which the Madonna and Child are still the Madonna and Child, but the material and the place and the time are different. So now we get to Buddhism. So earlier, I talked about the early bif bifurcation in Christianity, but there's also an early bifurcation in Buddhism. And the near side to me is the Theravada, which is called the, the, the religion of the elders, um, which is predominant in South Asia and Southeast Asia even today. Um, and this is an image from Thailand in the Newark Museum collection. But what the talk's really gonna focus about is the other form, the Mahayana form of Buddhism that's predominant in East Asia, in China, Korea, Japan, Tibet, and Vietnam, uh, with the beautiful Korean image of a Buddha. So you can see that just as the two Madonna do not look identical between Istanbul and Italy, neither do the two Buddha look identical between Thailand and Korea, Nonetheless, they have similarities. So now we get to really know Buddha. And um, th it is said that there are 32 major marks and 80 minor marks that are representative of a Buddha. One of the first things is this bump on his head, this extra bump on his head, um, because he's so smart, his brain won't be contained in a normal head. Then the second thing that you'll notice is this funny, almost bald spot in the front part of his head. That becomes really important in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, especially Japanese and Korean imagery, but is not found in other parts of Mahayana Buddhist tradition. He also has, I'm gonna back up, sorry, really long earlings, and you see that one, or earlobes, you see that one ear on the far side, because the historical Buddha was born as a prince who wore princely jewels that weighted down his earrings, uh, his earlobes, and that's why you see these elongated earlobes. You'll also see this full fleshy neck, because um, Buddhism practiced a, a religion of moderation, not extreme. So you're not supposed to be too fat or too thin. You're supposed to be just right. And just right is a little flesh around your neck so that you don't starve in the lean times, but not so fat that, 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 um, that you're taking food from others. He also has fleshy cheeks, a high, a high ridge nose, these um, uh, large eyes that even when the semi-closed state show power in their lip, and this wonderful kind of puckered mouth with very full lips, sometimes called bee stung lips, so pre-Botox, <laughs> or collagen, sorry. Um, so now we move on to two other examples of beautiful Buddhas. Um, and the one on the far side is from Korea, and the one on the near side is from Japan. And you'll see, in addition to that extra bump on the smartness on the top of his head, they also have a little dot in the center of their forehead. And that dot is called an urna, and it was supposed to be a, a clockwise spiral of hair that went around in the middle of his forehead that showed that he was really special. 
But there are many other things that are, that when you read the text, describe he has a chest like a lion with breadth and he has golden skin. Um, he has a jaw like a lion because the teaching of Buddhism is like the lion's roar. Um, but you also see here he has robes that show a semi-bared chest. And that, and, and a semi-bared chest is not typical clothing in Japan or Korea where these things are from. But a semi-bared chest was very typical clothing in India where the historical Buddha lived and taught. And so just as um, the Christ, uh, images of Christ show him not usually wearing an, um, a, a shirt at certain periods of time because of the hot climate there, um, that's the same case for the clothing of the historical Buddha. But the, the image on the far side, we can also look at gestures. So we all think about gestures. We've got good gestures like thumbs up for a like, not like, thumbs down. We've got hello, also goodbye, can be confusing. Um, we have okay, and we have rude gestures that I will not make. These gestures all communicate, and they're communicating in the sculpture as well. So the gesture on the far side is called an earth witnessing gesture. As the earth is my witness is a phrase that we might know, and that is exactly what the Buddha is saying. As the earth is my witness, I am, um, not being uh, tempted by Mara, the earth demon, into a life that is ordinary. I am transcending an ordinary life to the life of an enlightened being. That earth witnessing gesture is, as the earth is my witness, I have attained enlightenment. And the gesture with his other hand in his lap is a gesture of meditation to show that he had been meditating just before he attained enlightenment. But you'll notice that the guy on this side is not making that gesture. In fact, he's making a very interesting different gesture like this with his thumbs touching the tops of his fingers rolled like this. And with that gesture, we know that he is not depicted as the historical Buddha. So one of the things that most people don't know unless they study Buddhism is that there's more than one Buddha. Um, there's the historical Buddha from which all Buddhism is starting, but then there are these archetypical Buddhas, and this is one of those archetypical Buddhas. Buddha literally means enlightened or awakened, and this is the Buddha Amida, who becomes incredibly popular in Japan, and we'll see him again in this lecture, and he appears many times in the exhibition. This gesture is a gesture of like ultimate meditation, not a normal gesture of meditation with one hand flat on the other, but this extra pow empowering uh, meditation with the fingers folded like this. You'll also see that they're uh, cross-legged, and that posture is a posture of meditation, sitting there meditating. Uh, and then we've got that little hair piece. Um, and I also wanted to say that these two images are missing some of their stage settings. Um, stage settings like these, uh, these are in the Newark Museum collection, where you see the Buddhas are seated on lotuses, symbols of purity, sometimes elevated on a lotus throne, like you see on the near example. Um, but they still have all these other, um, and they also have a mandorla behind them, this big, almost like body halo all the way around them, showing that they're divine. But these examples, like the previous one, have that bump on the head, the jewel in the hair, a little uh, dot on the forehead, full face, lion chest, um, all these other icons that show that it's a Buddha. But these hand gestures, like this, are not the hand gestures of the historical Buddha. So they're also Amida Buddha. Whereas this example, also in the Newark Museum collection, is the historical Buddha with that same earth touching gesture and meditation gesture. This image looks very golden, but it has a high brass content, and its face looks very different. You see that blue color in the hair? Historically, in dark-haired cultures, the most beautiful shade of d black hair was a blue-black. You know when you look in a certain uh, light, dark blues can, or dark blacks can look bluish. And so in the Tibetan tradition, after the 18th century, they started grinding precious stones like lapis lazuli and azurite and painting hair like this to show that it was the most beautiful dark hair. And then they also started crushing gold and painting with cold gold a face like this over top of an existing sculpture. So that technique tells us that it's a particular Tibetan Buddhist sculpture. Um, this piece in the, in the exhibition upstairs at the Myers Collection is a spectacular image of a Buddha making the earth witnessing gesture and the meditation gesture. But you'll notice he's wearing a crown. And I was so excited when I saw earlier today 
Let me see. Uh, pointer. I didn't even practice with the pointer. Well, on his leg, um, where the robe comes out, um, incised on the edge of his leg is a symbol called a Vishvavadra. And we'll talk about a Vajra a little bit later on. It's a ritual scepter, but it's incised on his leg and falling from the fold of his cloth on his shoulder is a pendant jewel that suggests that instead of the historical Buddha, this might well be another archetypical Buddha, a, a, a Tathagata Buddha. Um, and this is a similar crowned Buddha in the Newark Museum collection. So you can see how these are much more similar to each other, although the one on the far side um, in the Myers collection also originally had a lotus seat that it's now missing. These pieces, um, the two on the far side are in the Myers collection, the one on the near side is in the Kimball collection, also on view, show standing Buddhas. And you see when they stand up, they behave a little bit differently. <laughs> The two on the far side have these beautiful lotus stands, still symbols of purity. And the reason why a lotus is a symbol of purity is because unlike a lily that sits on the surface of the water, a lotus, the roots go deep into the mud, the stem and the stalk and the flower and the leaves of the lotus all hover above the water in the air. So they're seen as a connection between the earth and the skies, the celestial heavens. Um, so they stand on lotus, uh, bases to show their purity, and they're wearing uh, robes that are very different from each other, and the one on the far side is wearing jewelry, and we're going to come back to that in a bit. He also has the most fabulous hairdo, and you look at him upstairs, go around to the back, and you'll see like parted and intertwined hair. It's amazing. Um, but the one just a uh, detail I really loved on this early Nepalese sculpture on the near side in the Kimball collection. When you look closely at the lowered hand, you'll see webbing between the fingers because that's another major mark of the historical Buddha is having this webbed kind of hand. These two Japanese examples, the one on the near side is in the Myers collection upstairs, and the one on the far side is in the Kimball collection, not currently on view. Um, you see that they are very similar to each other in terms of the way the garment is draped, um, also in terms of the proportion of the head. Um, but you see the one on the far side retains its mandorla, that wonderful um, halo around its body and head, and this very full lotus base. Um, the one on the near side is a bit older, and one of the things that I love looking at this is that, um, first of all, you can quite tell that it's made of wood, and Buddhas made of wood were very, very common in Japan. Um, and you can tell how many pieces it was made of because the tips of its toes are missing and they would normally be added on. The hands are removable and normally would be added on. The shoulders come from different pieces of wood. And there's um, sometimes historically in the interiors of these carved wooden pieces are inscriptions of the person who made it, when they made it, why they made it, and for what occasion. Um, so these two examples are obviously Japanese to anyone who looks at a Buddha from Japan, partially because they're made of wood, but also because they're the fashion of Japan. Um, this small shrine in the Newark Museum collection shows Amida in the center with two other of his attributes, a stele, which is um, that long inscription, which is the name of the donor who commissioned the piece, and this wish-granting gem in the bottom. Amida, in both of these instances, is worshipped um, for uh, a beautiful afterlife. A beautiful afterlife because although Buddhism teaches that if you attain enlightenment, you don't go to heaven, you get to experience nothingness. Somethingness or nothingness. Um, nirvana is the experience of non-being. Um, but a lot of people don't find that a very exciting idea for the next life or the reward. So instead, what they want is they, they want a paradise. And this beautiful painting in the exhibition upstairs shows a worshiper walking this fine white line between icy cold floodwaters and burning fires away from the perils of snakes and tigers and leopards and wild dogs and attacking marauders and even monks who, who shout encouragement and Amida Buddha is urging him forward on this path, and as he worships Amida Buddha, he goes towards Amida's western paradise. And that's what's happening as he walks along. One of my favorite details about this painting is if you look on the clothing, the golden clothing of the worshiper who's walking the path, you'll see punch mark coins and um, stylized rhinoceros tusks, which are symbols of riches and, 
riches that are Buddhist riches. And as he's walking along this white path, he's also counting his prayer beads. He's got a circlet of prayer beads. And he's saying the mantra to Omida, which is Om Amida Hum, Om Amida Hum, Om Amida Hum. And by repeating that mantra while counting his beads, he believes he will reach Western paradise, which is also what this shrine was doing, is the repetition of that so that the devotee might attain Western paradise. Now, in order to make the Western paradise of Amitabha jive with the idea of enlightenment, um, it was basically the best waiting room ever. When everybody is enlightenment, we will all experience nirvana. And until then, you can be in a paradise. And Western paradise of Avi Amitabha was it for Japan, especially, but also in Tibet and China. This spectacular Chinese example of Buddha in the center um, is surrounded, as you see, by lots of other Buddhas. So remember, there's not just one Buddha, there's more than one Buddha. Um, and in the lower left, this particular guy, um, here, I have a detail. This one in the lower left, he's holding up a flower, a lotus bud. And if you start looking at his clothing, his clothing doesn't look like all the rest of their clothing. His clothing looks a little fancier, a little less uh, Buddha-like, because he's not a Buddha. He's a bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is a being who could attain enlightenment, but who decides to remain in this world of samsara, this world of suffering, to help all sentient beings become enlightened. And that is often, the bodhisattva is seen as the assistance to Buddha. But my absolute favorite thing about this stele um, is also incised on the top is a very ornate canopy with curtains that come down, showing that this Buddha is seated in a very hallowed space. And at the bottom, these are fabulous, fabulous lotuses. Um, a lotus bud in the center and two lotus leaves that are coming out and saying, hello. And so even though he's not seated on a lotus throne, the lotus pond in front of him is showing that he's coming from a pure place. And on either side are two lions. Remember, the lion's roar is like the teachings of Buddhism. And that is what we see here at the bottom of this stele. And we see other lions in the exhibition upstairs. So lions, everywhere in the world, lions are seen as something incredibly positive, incredibly forceful, and, and, and um, we even call a group of lions a pride of lions, is how valued societally we think of as lions. On the far side is a marble lion from the Tang Dynasty in China, and you can see that the way that that lion is rendered with a mane is totally different than these two Japanese versions rendered in wood. So that stone, that limestone that you see on the far side, or sorry, marble that you see on the far side, is something that was really popular during the Tang Dynasty. So that material gives you an idea that the Tang um, Chinese uh, really loved that material to work with. Um, and that may or may not relate to Chinese interactions with Greeks who were also carving marble on that same period of time because the Silk Road was connecting both of them at those same periods of time. On the near side, um, one of my favorite details about this pair of guardian lions. So, you, you know, many a courthouse, or um, I don't know if some of you were familiar with the PBS TV show, Reading Between the Lions. Um, it was a, uh, a reading show related to the New York Public Library because there's two massive lions going up the steps as there are often in many, um, many uh, neoclassical buildings in America and of course classical buildings elsewhere. Well, these two lions are those guardian lions that you would find in a Japanese temple. And you see that one has a mouth closed and the other has the mouth open. And that is likened to saying the beginning and the end of an alphabet like the alpha and the omega. The be and because you have the beginning, which in the Sanskritic alphabet, that is the relationship here, the first syllable, I'm gonna drink first. The first syllable of the Sanskritic alphabet is ah. And the last syllable is mm. So, <laughs> let's try this together since you're responsive. Everybody, together, let us say OM. Ready? One, two, three. OM. Congratulations, you have just recited the entirety of the Sanskrit alphabet. 
because one of the reasons why they use the, the seed syllable om, why we actually even in popular culture know this term om, is because it encapsulates and compresses every single letter um, by the number of, of undulations. And recently I saw this great Stephen Fry thing where he taught, like, tried to count all these different vowels that were in a two-syllable Australian pronounced word. And om is kind of like that. So these two um, lions with their mouths open are essentially delivering to you the entirety of the possibilities, all the potentialities, not only of the universe now, but previously and in future. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so then we get to your poster child. I love this poster child. This is a piece from Densitile in Tibet. And um, the detail about this piece, so he's kneeling and holding up something because uh, it's not a normal human. This is called a Naga Raja, or a king of the Naga snakes. And on the tippy top of his head are a whole bunch of snakes' cowls, which you can see more easily in a similar example here from a different collection. So those snakes' cowls are coming out, and he has more than one snake head to show that he is the king of all the snakes. And why is that a good thing? That's a good thing because snakes are the guardians of riches in all Buddhist imagery. In uh, East Asian imagery, especially guard dragons, celestial dragons that have flaming pearls that come out of their mouths are also guardians of riches. But these Nagaraja are guardians of riches with the snakes on their head because snakes live underground and many riches come from under the ground. And not just silver and gold and diamonds and pearls and emeralds, pearls, okay, watery ground, but also, all the food that we eat. All the food that we eat comes from underground, whether it's the seed that grows the wheat or the rice or the pasta, you know, wheat becoming pasta, or whether it's the grass that the cattle feed on. All food comes from underground. So we're talking about riches that are uh, spendable, riches that are edible, and therefore metaphors for riches that are spiritual. But where would this such a figure be originally? He's a great piece of sculpture, but what kind of, of function did he serve when he was part of a Tibetan Buddhist temple? Well, here's a historic photograph, and he be, can be hard to spot, so I thought I'd point him out this way. So what you're seeing just above him is a huge oversized lotus flower, and he is holding up the petals of the lo lotus flower from his watery subterranean world as he's surrounded by a vine to support all this pantheon of deities above him. So it's actually a really great poster child for the show because it supports everything else, all the riches of the show, whether they're silk riches or jade riches or even ceramic riches. And this piece, um, which is in the catalog, I didn't realize it wasn't on view, is still one of my favorite pieces. The one on the near side is in the Myers collection, but the one on the far side is in the Newark Museum collection. And what these represent, I think you can see, are lotuses. You see the lotus flowers pierced inside, and you see there's a bow that is tied in front. And then on the far side, you can see these, um, they're called punch mark coins, a circular coin with a square in the center, as well as flowers that are raining down from this banner. These would have been in a Japanese Buddhist temple, similar to this one, and this is where they would hang around the deity. And they would hang because, of course, when a divine creature appears, beautiful things happen, rains of flowers happen, and these rich golden versions of those flowers are one of the ways in which J Japanese Buddhist temples really show off um, that divinity within the, within the uh, shrine. You can also see on either side metal forms of lotuses that are offerings to the deity. But anybody looking at this temple um, who was familiar with Japan would say, oh yeah, that's a Japanese temple. But this is not a Japanese temple. This is a Tibetan Buddhist temple. And I want you to look at the tippy top. You see these kind of hanging banners? Those are very similar to the ones that are incised in the stone piece. Here, I'm going to go all the way back. There we are, right there. You see that kind of curtain? And you see how those lotuses look like the lotuses on the metal banner? There. And there. In addition, 
when we look closer at this historic photograph in the Newark Museum collection, you'll see these cloth banners that are also symbols of jewels that are raging, raining down from the heavens with this trefoil top that's like a cloud. You also find two lions on the side and two lions, like two lions facing forward and then two lions above. So that lion throne, the, the, the lion's roar is the teachings of Buddhism. You also find this in the Newark Museum altar. So this is a consecrated altar, consecrated by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1989. And this um, banner in the Newark Museum collection is very similar to the Japanese forms of banners as well as um, in terms of their function within the temple space. And then this is a Korean temple. And you can see this top part here has totally different style of lotuses. Those are lotus lanterns that are only found like this in Korean Buddhism. But you also see this great canopy. And this canopy is carved from wood to look like this textile banners. And while this is a relatively recent um, redoing of this temple in the DMZ zone, it is there because this central Buddha, um, who's holding his finger like this that shows that he's a particular archetypical Buddha, is from the Shilla period. The very first head that we looked at, that solitary head, is the same period. It's a cast iron piece dated by inscription to the 8th century. Um, and it's such an amazing um, sculpture, um, but it was found in part because of reconstruction in the DMZ, and they've built a new temple to honor him. And instead of the metal lotuses on either side, they have these great um, LED light lotuses as light offerings that they give to the Buddha. And I say great because I like to see the living religion move forward. It's not always to everybody's aesthetic taste, but it makes me giggle in a good way. Um, which brings us out of the realm of Buddhas and into the realm of bodhisattvas. Um, all three of these figures are not Buddhas. They are bodhisattvas, enlightened beings. And the reason you can tell that is because of the bling they wear. They all wear jewelry. You see the necklace on this one with his fabulous hairdo and he's got a diadem. Um, and you see in the center one, many, many, many jewels. These two are Japanese on, on the near side. And on the far side is a Chinese version, also with a big necklace, a lot of swag going on. And the reason why bodhisattvas get bejeweled is because they did not uh, ever become ascetics. They were able to be enlightened and chose not to. And so their iconography rewards them by looking bejeweled. And that is also true when you look at these two flanking examples in the Kimball collection. The one on the near side is a torso of a bodhisattva um, from the Tang Dynasty with these great gems that are coming down, this swag necklace, and these, um, this kind of X-like gem that falls all the way down that often looks like a certain kind of ribbed flower but can be interpreted as flower garlands or jeweled garlands. And on the far side, even earlier, in Gandhara, present-day Afghanistan, um, is an early form of a bodhisattva. And I want you to pay attention not only to his great jewelry, which I love, but the, the bow at his belly. He's got a specific tie to the way that the bow is at his belt. And we'll see that again in a completely different place. Um, you also see this fabulous, iconic version of Guan Yin, the bodhisattva of compassion. <clears throat> the piece on the near side is the one in the Myers collection upstairs. <clears throat> and the one on the far side is in the Newark Museum collection. And this is often called Guan Yin of the South China Seas, who seats himself or herself, because it's gender neutral actually, um, in this form, um, on a prominence near the ocean. Um, and so this is a posture of royal ease for both of them. But what's really interesting about the Myers example is that the hand behind is resting on a book. When you go upstairs and look at this, it's really easy to see the book. And you can see that it's bound into one, two, three, four, five, six, I think six folios. And that Chinese books today can still be made in that format. The other thing that's really great about comparing these two examples um, is not how different their jewelry is. They both, have diff they both have jewelry. They have a similar kind of shoulder shawl, a similar lower garment. <clears throat> they also have nearly identically the same hairdo this fabulous coiffure that goes in a big chignon-like thing on the top of their head, which is really typical of the Song Dynasty of China, but not so much the other time periods in China. 
Um, and I was really excited also to see this beautiful um, wooden piece in the Myers collection, because look how close his necklace is to the necklace at the Newark Museum. A lot of fun. You'll also see that he's on this lotus, <coughs> showing that he is um, coming from a pure divine space. Um, these are images of a different bodhisattva called Jizo in Japanese, <coughs> and they're both Japanese images. Um, the one on the far side is in the Newark Museum collection. The one on the near side is in the Myers collection. And you see that they have a head that looks a little bit more like a Buddha, <coughs> and that he doesn't have the normal jewelry of a bodhisattva, but he's supposed to hold a staff, which this one does, and a gem. And we know that they're supposed to hold that, um, but often they go missing because they're made separately from the pieces. But if you look at paintings, like this Korean painting of the same deity in the Newark Museum collection, that is the staff that he's holding, and this is the gem that he's holding. My other favorite thing about this painting, just to connect back to the two lions we saw with their mouths, one open and one closed, in the upper corner of this painting, there's a fierce deity with his mouth closed, on the opposite side, a fierce deity with his mouth old. He's got a big bushy beard. It's doing the same thing, um, throughout all of those creatures. <clears throat> I also really adore this ritual implement that's in the Myers collection upstairs on the far side. It's called an Egoro incense burner, and you see that lotus shape, again, lotus symbol of purity, and what's sitting on it? A lion, because, of course, the lion's roar is the teachings of Buddhism. Uh, this painting um, in the Newark Museum collection shows a particular historic figure, Shotoku Taishi, holding that kind of Egoro incense burner. And this painting in the Myers collection is an illustrated story of the life of Shotoku Taishi. So, <clears throat> if you already know the story, you can read this like a comic book. And it goes from the top to the bottom. And every exciting part, narrative, uh, like one of the latest Marvel cartoons or Marvel movies would be uh, depicted in a, in a painting like this. And this is a similar format from a different saint in the Newark Museum collection. So you see how you, and uh, Newark's is also inscribed every episode, just like a comic book has its written what's gone on. And in the bottom here, you actually see a monk uh, try, uh, praying to Amitabha to go to Amitabha's Western Paradise, which is what you're seeing in the second row. Um, Newark has a complete set of four of these, so you can see how long they were. And they were used um, by professional storytellers, um, usually nuns, sometimes monks, who had a pointer who would sing the song of the story as it went through and point to the different episodes, particularly during festivals. And one of my other favorite things in the exhibition upstairs that is evident in paintings like this is a ritual implement. And the one in the collection up in the exhibition upstairs is here in the lower near side. And it's huge. It's really big. Um, <clears throat> the two on the far side are in the Newark Museum collection. And they're also Japanese. But above is one in the Newark Museum collection that's a Tibetan version of the same ritual implement. It's a scepter <clears throat> called a vajra in Sanskrit, um, but it's called a dorje in Tibetan, it's called a kongo in Japanese, a gumgong in Korean. And um, so I'm also grateful that uh, Marvel has brought back some of the story, or actually, um, which one was it? Sorry, my brain just totally blanked. But the stories of, oh, Clash of the Titans. So I bring up Clash of the Titans because Zeus, wields a thunderbolt, right? That's what this represents. This represents that kind of thunderbolt in the sky. The name is almost untranslatable. They're sometimes called a diamond, meaning hard and clear and bright. The diamond's the hardest substance in the world. <clears throat> sometimes it's called adamantine, as in indestructible. Um, but all of those things are what this ritual scepter does. Um, it is held in particular positions, and for any of you who have ever seen or want to see on YouTube or li in life um, a Tibetan Buddhist sand mandala, when they first do the outline for the sand mandala, sorry, that was my timer, so my time's almost up, <laughs> um, the, which is good because I'm almost out of slides. Um, the, the monks will circumscribe the mandala using a scepter like this, and after they've put all this beautiful sand to make this amazing picture, they take this ritual scepter and they cut with this scepter through the sand to ritually dis disperse this, the, the, the sand of the mandala. Um, 
And you can see that same ritual scepter held by these two patriarchs here um, in the paintings in the Myers collection upstairs. <clears throat> so, um, these, these two patriarch images are lineage images. What it means is that one teacher in one painting taught another teacher in another painting, and on down the line, until the temple that commissioned these paintings, their living teacher taught. So it's like <clears throat> when you go to a really prestigious university and you go to the boardroom, and the, all the presidents of the college are in the top to show you how important that place is. And we have this many times in um, our own iconography in the West. So this is Christopher Columbus landing in America and Native Americans being glad he's there. <laughs> right? You have a power of telling history when you show this. And this is my favorite American lineage painting, Mount Rushmore. So yes, George Washington lived at the same time as Thomas Jefferson, but Lincoln did, was not living at the same time, but nonetheless, the baton of the presidency, the great men of presidencies, passed according to this lineage image, from Washington to Jefferson to Lincoln, and then to Teddy, who of course helped commission the piece because of his role in the, in the Park Service, Teddy Roosevelt. We also have American legends like Johnny Appleseed that show you a particular region in time, and Paul Bunyan, iconography where he's got his blue ox with him. Um, and that relates uh, also to these earlier iconographic images here in the Kimball collection. On the far side is St. Anthony being tormented by devils, and on the near side is St. Matthew holding a Bible, because of course he was one of the gospel writers. Um, and that connects us to one of my favorite pieces on view, the Lonely Sage, or the Taoist Hermit. Um, this is a Korean painting, um, and you see a very old man with very long, long white eyebrows. I love how long his eyebrows are. They're almost to his shoulders. <laughs> um, he's got this bamboo staff with a dragon head at the end, and this great white um, it's a yak tail, which was used as a kind of high-class fly whisk, um, but a symbol of great uh, prestige. He's seated under a pine tree um, in a mountainous landscape, and the mountains are shown also by these wonderful uh, clouds that are above his head. But you have a spectacular example here at the Kimball, right there, um, not yet on view. I know he'll come back. Um, and you can see how similar these two are to each other except the Kimball example also has this cute little blue deer that he's petting, which is an, um, another sign of, um, of uh, longevity. Um, and this, is, uh, this figure would have held a particular place in a Korean Buddhist temple, and this is a picture I took in Korea of um, the lonely sage. And you can see the painting behind, but you can see there's also a sculpture of the same fellow in front. And that was, as a devotee, when you go to the temple, you see you know, the painting come out at you in 3D by having the sculpture in, in actual space and not just in a painted space. And he belongs as part of a certain party of friends. And this is the, the, the company he keeps. So the, the lonely sage is on the far side image, and in the near side is an image of the Big Dipper the seven stars of the Big Dipper. Um, here looking like Buddhas, because it's in a Buddhist temple. And in the side closest to me is a mountain spirit with his tiger and tree and long beard, um, which is what the Newark Museum has. So I was just chatting with Jennifer about joining um, your um, lovely mountain spirit painting with our Big Dipper and, Mount, and uh, aesthetic painting. These are what Korean temples look like. They actually don't look at all like Japanese temples or Tibetan temples. Um, and I wanted to finish on what's your beginning poster image, uh, not poster, but um, your first impression when you come to the exhibition, this amazing piece that looks like it's probably from China. And the textiles are from China, but the piece is from Tibet. And I'm not going to talk about it because I know Lee's going to talk to you, uh, Lee Talbot from the Textile Museum is going to talk to you about textiles. But my favorite thing is that you might get very confused as to the shape of this because those um, sides have these huge pleats in them and they just kind of look awkward. You're like, people aren't shaped that way. Robots are shaped that way. People aren't shaped that way. So why is that shaped that way? Well, because in Tibet, they traded horses and musk and precious fungus to the Chinese for these brocades. None of what Tibet traded to China survives in China because it was all consumable. But all of these Chinese textiles were used and preserved in Tibet. 
And these are examples of how they would be worn in religious dances in Tibet. Um, this is a historic photograph of Newark's collection and Newark's version of the same dance costume. But this is how they're danced. So you see that there's pleats that come down the side of this costume. And when the monks spin, like whirling dervishes, because that kind of spinning is unique, or not unique, is universal for all ecstatic religions that wanting to spin, um, the spinning motion rolls out the pleats so it looks like it's just a big dome. And that is symbolically the top of the world, the dome of the earth that goes then up to the heavens and he's wearing a cloud collar and then from his head up, he's a divine being. Um, and here you see that same garment at rest on a figure as opposed to um, inflated. So with that, I'm going to end my lecture. And I know earlier I said, I promise you at the end, you'll be able to tell where all these different places come from into relation to the sculpture. Well, I'm not gonna quiz you all because it's difficult with a big room, but in the upper corner, you have a Korean standing Buddha, then a Tibetan or Nepalese, because the Nepalese made Buddhas like this for, for the Tibetan market, then this beautiful Nepalese Buddha in the Kimball collection, this amazing Korean seated Buddha, um, in the Myers collection, this great standing Japanese Buddha in the um, Kimball collection, the amazing Chinese stone Buddha in the uh, Myers collection, that fabulous Bodhisattva in the Myers collection with his great hairdo, please see him. He's also got clothing tied to look like an Indian clothing where the, the cloth is wrapped between the legs and then comes back up the top. He's really amazing, he's really early. And then not currently on view, but one of my favorite things in the Kimball collection is on the far side, a Cambodian Buddha. So you can see yet again, a totally different iteration. So thank you very much. Please do visit us in Newark. <laughs> we actually, um, people will fly to Newark to go to New York. So we are closer to New York than you are to Dallas. <laughs> uh, 15 minutes from uh, New York's Penn Station as well as the airport. Um, and if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Yes? So I'm gonna repeat the question, who makes these things? Who are the makers? What is known about them? Well, of course, for different time periods and different places, different pieces of evidence are, are relevant. So we do know that there were monks who did make sculptures and paintings, but we also know that they were people who were not monks who made sculptures and paintings, both for monastic use and for lay use, um, people who are devout but who are not monks or nuns. Um, in, uh, the Japanese tradition especially, um, many artist names are recorded, but probably even more unrecorded artists made things than are recorded artists. In the Korean tradition, some artists are recorded, but again, more unrecorded than not. And there was a whole studio system too, so just like a studio of Rubens was not necessarily Rubens' paintbrush, um, you would train in carving or painting, and there, there may be many hands at work on certain types of things. Um, in the Tibetan and Nepali tradition, um, the metal sculptures are made with a lost wax casting process that usually was a hereditary family that taught that process because it was a trade secret for how to process the metal in a particular way. You had a corner on the market. And that uh, powdered gold that was painted on the face in Tibet um, actually uh, is a trade secret of a certain group of Newar ethnic people from Nepal originally that settled in Lhasa and only they knew how to powder the gold just right. So it's really very specific to each region in different time period. In China, I mean, China is as large as the United States for landmass, not including Alaska, um, and, 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 and very, very diverse traditions. There were both recorded artists and not recorded artists. So it's, it's a, it, it, often, you know, religious art in the West is similar. You'll know certain artists, but you won't know many artists. Yes?
Uh, there is for each region. So if you're interested in, uh, and well, th this is true, especially for the Japanese and Korean traditions. Um, they are very, uh, and, the, and the Chinese tradition, they will very be able very easily to show you linear progressions for different periods of time and materials and making and styles and fashion. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, um, there's a huge amount of revivalism, so you can, um, you can tell in much broader swaths of time. So it's easy to tell what would happen before 1400 and between 1400 and 1700 and between 1700 and 200, but you know, that's plus or minus a couple hundred years. So, <laughs> um, and they'll also do, you know, you have a beautiful bust from Hiram Powers of the Greek slave, you know, so just as there's an American neoclassicism, if you, you know, if the apocalypse happened and the American marbles were buried next to the Greek marbles that are upstairs, would in a thousand years time people be able to tr tell initially which is which? It's that kind of, 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 of reiteration for, um, for certain um, images that become powerful and reused. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm glad you asked. Um, there's all sorts of theories about potential transmission between East and West in early um, Christian and Buddhist iconography. So we know Alexander the Great uh, went to India and, and Afghanistan, um, you know, before Christ. <laughs> Um, and there's, you know, there's a discussion about Christ's missing years and where he might have gone to Asia. Also, the style of monasticism that arises with Christianity didn't necessarily happen, um, did, didn't necessarily have the same kind of precedent in the West as that, the, that style of monasticism that already is, existed in Asia. These are all great theories. I don't know if any of you have read the, the book Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, but it's a fabulous book about the question of transmission of things like Mandora is from one side to another side, or halos from one side to another side, versus mutually exclusive self-arising systems. And the example that Diamond gives that I think is so beautiful is writing systems. So it's obvious that the Chinese writing system was transmitted to Japan and Korea because they both used it for a really, really long time before adapting that writing system to something else. Our writing system comes from a Roman tradition of writing, just as the Russian system of writing comes from a Greek system of writing. And of course, all the Arabic languages come from a different Arabic writing tradition, and the Hebrew languages come from a different writing tradition. So you can see within the writing system when it's transmitted, but clearly all these writing systems are happening on their own. So for mandorlas, we don't have an answer. We don't know if it was transmitted from one side to another side or if it was something that just developed because when we look at each other as human beings, when you see the one, they go, oh, we, <laughs> we, 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 we don't know. We, we, we can't be sure because it's not as clear cut as a writing system, but a great question. Last question, yes? Um, the question, sorry, the question was that she had never seen the webbing between the fingers before and she was wondering when that caught on. Um, so, uh, the, there's this symbiotic relationship that is not, uh, a symbiotic relationship between text and image. In text, there are books that describe these 32 ma major and 80 minor marks of the Buddha. But the book that you might read might be a little bit different than the book that your neighbor writes me, might read. So the webbing is described in the, in the books within the South Asian tradition, and then um, is, inscribed, is, is written in some parts of the East Asian tradition, but it falls away as the most important characteristic compared to other characteristics. So um, that webbing you know, has certainly existed since the earliest depictions of Buddha from the South Asia tradition, and I think it, I, I don't remember how early that happens in China, um, but it, it's pretty early in some regions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, have a great evening.